Amen. In 2018, Mary, and that's not her real name, was a healthy woman in her late 20s. She came from a nominal Christian background and she was diagnosed with a rare kind of cancer. Mary and her physician, who was, or was my wife, Tracy, uh, during their, her care of Mary, they formed a deep sisterly spiritual bond with one another. And from the beginning, Tracy had this very unusual sense that, that God intended to heal Mary, that he was going to act. And after treatment, and Tracy didn't say anything to Mary at the time, but in her silent prayers for, for her, uh, Mary was, uh, was uh, healed of the cancer. For, and for one and a half years, she was healthy. Uh, but then the cancer came back, uh, spreading throughout her body. And she became very sick. And she was admitted into the hospital at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Despite this diagnosis of the metastatic cancer and the failure of medicines, Tracy still had this very unusual deep sense that God intended to heal Mary. And for weeks, she had this sense that she was supposed to give Mary a bracelet. I, I brought the bracelet with me. Uh, it's just a silver bracelet that was given to Tracy by one of her patients years before, and Tracy would wear it, and it had, it's had a very special meaning to her. And she felt that God was telling her to give this bracelet uh, to her patient, to Mary. Inside, there's a, a phrase from Psalms 46.5. It says, God is within her she will not fall. And Tracy finally got the courage to go to Mary and, uh, and she sat down with Mary and her husband and she gave her the bracelet which Mary received with a great amount of uh, joy and she put it right on her right wrist and they prayed together. And they wept together there on that bed on the 16th floor of the hospital because they knew that the time was short and this was perhaps their last goodbye. But still, Tracy felt God was supposed to do something. God was going to heal Mary. She knew it in her soul. But the next day after this visit that Tracy had giving her the bracelet, Mary was discharged to hospice and six weeks later, she died. Our text, James 5, 13 through 18, calls us as Christians to healing prayer. Healing prayer, it's a practice that actually flows out of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The, the, the power and the energy of his life in resurrection flows through us, to us, in healing. And when there is healing, it's an, on account of the resurrection of the from Christ from the grave. But how can we believe in resurrection or in healing prayer when death seems so prominent, preeminent? Our prayers seem so weak and they seemingly go unanswered. Well, I think we can begin to understand the nature of healing prayer by asking four questions in engagement of our text this morning from James chapter 5. The first question is this, and it's the question that's in verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? Now this word sick can be translated either physical sickness or it can also mean weak. Particularly in the New Testament, it can mean a kind of spiritual weakness. It can be weak in faith, that's Romans 14.1. Weak in conscience, 1 Corinthians 8.11. One can be weak against temptation. That's Mark 14. Or in Romans chapter 5, verse 6, this, this word weak is referring to our, the nature of our own sin. While we were still weak or sick, spiritually sick, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And it's important to understand that throughout the scriptures, there's a relationship between physical illness on the one hand and spiritual weakness or illness on the other. 
there is an, what we might call an analogical relationship, or the technical term would be a sacramental relationship, in which the physical sign in the material realm represents or mirrors the spiritual realm in some particular special way. Like a mirror, sickness can teach us about spiritual truths or spiritual realities. Physical uh, sickness can teach us about the sickness within our soul, and God can use sickness, the evil of sickness, and draw out of it teachings to our spirit so that we might grow in actual spiritual health. There are many examples of this in the Bible. For example, Jacob's limp in Genesis was a constant reminder to him to yield to the strength of God. God wasn't going to heal the limp because the limp was, had its purpose to teach Jacob about God. Mephibosheth, which is in 1 Samuel, his walking disability taught that the Messiah is merciful today despite our own sin and brokenness on account of a prior generation's faithfulness. Or there's Naaman's leprosy, which demonstrated that there is no salvation that is found outside of Israel. Or there's Paul's thorn in the flesh, which showed that God's grace is sufficient, sufficient despite our human weakness. Or the course in John 9, there's the man born blind who endured so many years of physical blindness so that at the right moment, Christ would come along and glorify himself and bring this man great joy as well uh, in the display of his power and healing. The truth is the Holy Spirit uses physical illness as a metaphor within our lives, if you pay attention, to spiritual realities. Perhaps you deal with nagging back pain uh, because, and it forces you every time you feel that pain to, to pray. It prompts you to pray. But it's not just for your back but you're prompted instead to pray for all the aches and the pains that don't seem to go away in our world. Some of us have uh, lost the ability to taste from COVID or from various kinds of treatment. And in the loss of taste, that sad loss around food, you begin to realize the promise of Psalm 119, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. And physical illness can, in fact, reveal weaknesses in your soul. You get sick and something starts to happen within you. you. You have anxiety. You realize you're deeply dependent on yourself. You feel shame. You realize you have weak faith. There's staggering on terrible fear. Did the illness put those things in you? No. The illness simply was revealing what remained hidden. But now you can see. So is anyone among you sick? Well, what are you to do if you recognize the sickness? Many don't want to recognize sickness within themselves, and they put their head in the sand. But the scriptures call us to recognize the sickness, the many kinds of sickness. And in James 5, we're told to do two things, that are commanded to do two things. Verse 14, to call for the elders of the church to pray, which is an invitation for you, if you're sick, to initiate. We're not going to come and knock on your door. You have to recognize your own sickness and call and ask for help. And it's in your initiation that demonstrates that you're ready to receive the help that you need. And so you can call for the elders of the church. And after the service, we'll be praying for anyone who would uh, like healing prayer. And we will, if you ask, we will anoint you with oil. And if you're not ready for that today, we'll, at our next First Friday prayer, we'll uh, give opportunity to, uh, to anoint with oil. And if you're not able to come at all, you call or you email us, and we'll come to you. That's what we're commanded to do so. The elders are commanded to do this. And then the verse 16, the sick are commanded to do one other thing. It says, if there is sin, confess it. Notice that James says, if... It doesn't assume that there's an immediate relationship between physical illness and spiritual illness. But if there is illness, when you do that work within yourself, you're called to confess it. And that raises the next question. What is the role of confession uh, in the Bible, and particularly in James chapter 5? Look at verse 16. It says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Confession of sins. It's the admitting to God 
of the faults that lie within your soul and doing it, in fact, in front of the Christian community or at least in front of other Christians. That's the, the call and the invitation. Confession itself has a therapeutic dimension to it in and of itself, whether a physical uh, illness is uh, the healing comes or not. Because confession, as we'll read in a few minutes from Psalm 51, confession cleans the heart. It renews the spirit. It restores the joy of salvation. It's also important to recognize that sometimes unconfessed sin actually leads to physical illness. David actually links these in Psalm 38. There's no health in my bones, he says, because of my sin. And there is this link between body and spirit. Jesus, in John 5, he says to the paralytic, after healing the paralytic, he says to him, stop sinning or something worse is going to happen to you. Now, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his wonderful little book, Life Together, in the final chapter in chapter 5, if you haven't read it, it's worth, it's worth reading. It's about the centrality of confessing sins. Bonhoeffer he writes, those who remain alone with their evil are left utterly alone. You see, he, he says, without confession within the Christian community, we end up building what he calls a pious community that ends up being trapped in lies and hypocrisy. But you see, confession of, of concrete specific sins to another brother or sister in, uh, in Christ he says, as soon as the confession crosses your lips, immediately sin is broken and there is freedom and there is no longer any need for self-justification and for running away. But you see, when sin lies hidden and unconfessed, he says a parent community is simply a sham community. But by confession... He writes, the pious community is done away. With one sinner standing in a community of sinners, all living by the grace of God under the cross of Jesus Christ. And James actually says in verse 16 that calls us to mutual confession. Verse 16, confess your sins to one another. There's, a, there's an exchange of confession. And that's because we're all priests. And there is no hierarchy between any of us. We're all called to lay ourselves before one another. And all of us are qualified to receive confession. And to declare the forgiveness of Christ over that confession. Mutual confession, it's not a witch hunt. It opens a grace and spirit filled space that's necessary for healing. You don't go into the operating room with mud flung on the walls and everyone smoking cigarettes. No. And just like you have to prepare the OR, in order for healing prayer to take place, we need to be prepared. The participants need to be prepared. And how does that happen? Through the cleansing power of the confession of sins. Together we create this amazing space of grace in which we practice Psalm 139.23 together in which we say, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me. and Lead me in the way everlasting. And so in the practice of, of healing prayer, if you were to call the elders, the, the leader of that time, it's right and good before offering healing prayer is to give an invitation and say to everyone who is present, does anyone have sin that they need to confess? We create a, a space of confidentiality, and you are welcome to confess it now before the Lord. And then, and only after then, going into healing prayer. You see, confession of sins is a precondition for powerful healing prayer that James is talking about in this text. Verse 16, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. To be a righteous person, that, that's not part of being some spiritual elite class with a, the halo over your head. That's not how it works at all. To be a righteous person is to have been to give your life over to the only one who is righteous, Jesus Christ. 
And as you put faith in him and confess your sins, his righteousness clothes you. That's what it means to be righteous. And it will work its way in within the inner man and work its way out. But it's the righteousness of Christ that clothes you. And as you confess sins, you become interconnected more deeply within that righteousness. And that's what supercharges prayer. You see, if you have unconfessed sin, there's a reason why it seems that your prayers hit the ceiling and don't go anywhere. Because with unconfessed sin, you have weak faith. It, it strips your assurance and, and your confidence in believing in the promises of God because you're not acting on them. So why would God hear the prayer itself? It's, it says in Proverbs, your prayer ends up being just an abomination to him because you're unwilling to do what's necessary within. No, it's not being saintly. It's, in fact, in verse 17, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He was human. He was sinful. He was weak. And he, too, like you and me, need to confess our sins. And in doing so, prayer becomes empowered. It becomes empowered because you know then how to pray. There becomes a clarity within you on what to pray for. And you have great assurance and confidence in doing so. But powerful prayer is not immediate necessarily. You should not expect instantaneous results. In fact, we, we learn that just as Elijah prayed in 1 Kings, not once, it says seven times he got down on his knees and, and he was praying. Prayer doesn't get imme ans answered immediately. That's part of the nature of God and his design around prayer. The servant boy had to go. I don't see anything, Elijah. One and two and three and over and over, seven times. To get us to understand you can't give up. There's nothing, Elijah, I don't see it. But Elijah didn't give up. Nor should you, nor should we. James actually uses the word prayer in this text seven times in order to help us convey the understanding that you've got to pray and pray and pray. There's a call to not give up. And among those seven times of using prayer, there's four actually different Greek words that express prayer. In our in the ESV, it all is translated prayer, but there's actually four different words for prayer. One word means petition. A second word means prayer with a vow. A third is crying out to the Lord. And a fourth is making demanding pleas. The point is that we have to make all kinds of prayers. You keep on praying. Don't expect to be, the prayer to be answered first time. That's, that's not what the scriptures teach. You don't give up. You have to pray unrelentingly. A few generations ago, Christians used the phrase importune prayer. Importune, that's actually a, a word that has a negative connotation. It, it means excessive persistence, bordering on obnoxious, unrelenting requests. And the Lord calls us into such importune prayer. I recently saw an example of importune prayer earlier this year. Uh, I went uh, along with another member to uh, visit one of the members of our church who is in her 90s. Uh, she's elderly, but quite spry in, in spirit. And she listens to our radio service at, at the 11 a.m. service. Perhaps she's listening right now. As we visited, I had the unfortunate uh, duty uh, to report to her that the radio program was coming to an end. And as I told her, she said, oh no, that, that can't be. The Lord doesn't want that. That's what she said. Because she had not only been listening to the radio broadcast, but she had been praying persistently and consistently for it, that the healing power of God would flow to all the ears who might hear it, wherever they, they may be. And it's one of those events you really remember. She got down, she has this prayer pad, and she got down on her knees. And I, I had to actually help her get down because she is an older woman. And she prayed like you've never heard someone pray with earnest, 
and certainty that God would act. And she seemed certain that whatever the, the things I had told her, I said, it's, it's done. She said, no. And she knew it was not done. And of course, if you know the story, at the last minute, several people uh, uh, did make pledges to give to the radio program to continue it for this, for, at least for this year. But it wasn't them who, who held off the radio program coming to an end. It, I believe at least, it was this earnest elderly woman who you could take tanks and elephants and lions and all the rest and put her against her and she would win. Not because she's strong in herself, but because she has the prayers of a righteous person and she won't give up. Friends, do you give up? Would you listen to the witness of Elijah, the witness of this earnest woman who is in our own midst? Is there something that you need to pray and pray seven times until the Lord hears it and responds? Don't give up! Well, there's a third question, and I only will cover it very briefly. And it's the question around what is the purpose of the anointing with oil. We don't have enough time to address it. We have a healing seminar that you can register for uh, and, and find out more. We'll dig deeper into many of these things. I just, but I do want to just touch on it very briefly. When the oil is applied uh, to the sick person, it symbolizes consecration. You remember that the prophets and the priests and the kings were all anointed with oil and it was a demonstration that they were being consecrated or set apart to the Lord and that the Holy Spirit's health, his fullness, was being put upon that person. So much so that this act is what Messiah or anointed one means. It's the anointing of the, of the Holy Spirit over Christ himself. Christ which means Messiah, it means anointed one. And when we put the oil on the person, what that oil means is that the messianic oil of all of its health and abundance is dripping down on you. The Spirit's health is for you, and it's on you, and you've been set apart for these very purposes. And I can't really explain this too much, but simultaneously, oil was a well-known medicine within the ancient world, such as when the Good Samaritan, when he came... Uh, and poured oil and, and wine on the man's wounds. It had a medicinal value. And I would suggest to you it's not only this consecration, but it's also this uh, anointing of where the Lord is endorsing the use of the medical arts for our bodily ailments. The biblical view is not either prayer alone or trust in man and science and medicine. No, not at all. Both are from the Lord. And both are to be used and received with gladness as in the Lord. But let me go to a fourth and final question. Is this question of is healing guaranteed? Is healing guaranteed? There actually have been probably three main Christian approaches to that question. One view is, is that healing ceased at the end of the apostolic age. And I, I once held to this view. But upon further reflection, I've come to, to believe that just as Christ's compassion was demonstrated in his healings during that first uh, generation of the preaching of the gospel and touching the suffering of the people then, we have the same suffering. And we also have the same compassionate God. And just as the healings attested to the veracity of the preaching of the gospel in the first generation during the apostolic age, even so, there are many hard hearts now that need, unfortunately, need to see the power of God in his compassion and his power. And sometimes the Lord also gives attestation to his power today through healing. Of course, the opposite view of the cessationist view is that healing is guaranteed if the sick person, if the sick person has great faith. It's sometimes called faith healing. And of course, if no faith, uh, if no healing takes place, the sick person is then blamed for failing uh, to, for, for failing to have the, uh, uh, either unconfessed sin or lack of faith. Uh, but you can see how it very quickly, it leads into 
manipulation, uh, the industry of religion in which people pursue healing because they, they're desperate and taking advantage of them. It gives many false promises in which people think they're going to be healed physically and then they're not, and it leads to a great amount of doubt within themselves and within, with others. It's not the right view at all. The view I would commend to you might be called the sovereign divine healing view. It's that the Holy Spirit blows wherever he wishes, upon whomever he wishes, whenever he wishes. He invites us to ask, and to ask with great faith that God would bring his healing. And we are invited to use this importune prayer, but then ultimately to surrender to his will. For the Spirit knows exactly what you need and exactly what your family member or friend needs and to trust him in how he delivers. The powering of healing prayer has actually been known throughout the generations of the church. One great example is from Augustine. Augustine initially held to the cessationist view that healing miracles had ceased with the, at the age of the apostles, at the end of the apostle apostolic era. But in his old age, he actually retracted this view. And in his magnum opus, The City of God, he recorded 70 healing miracles that he either witnessed himself or he knew of reliable witnesses who reported of those healings. But it's not just 1,500 years ago. Even in our own church, I've had the privilege of knowing several who have experienced a great amount of healing. And even two who have experienced healing when the doctors said that they could do nothing. And so we're encouraged to ask. Ask. He's a compassionate and powerful God. To ask with faith. That power of the resurrection, which happened 2,000 years ago, is the same surging energy that exists right now in our midst. But one needs to ask with faith. So is healing guaranteed then? Well, I think the answer is yes. But it's yes, but we have to understand that there is both a lesser and a greater healing. Physical healing is the lesser healing. But the healing of the soul, far and wide, is the greater miracle, you see. So let's say you have cancer. And by prayer and medicine, God heals you. Praise God. You should be full of gratitude and thanks. But even so, that healing is only temporary. And let's say after you've been healed, you don't grow in the Lord. You squander your time. You don't serve him with all of your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Then were you really healed? So then what is the guarantee as we read it in verse 15? The prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. The promise is that if you confess your sins, if you put faith in Christ, if you consecrate yourself over to him with all of your soul, then this salvation, this great salvation, the forgiveness of sins and eternal life with resurrection of these very bodies is the promise that has been given to all of us. Temporal physical healing is short term. And to put all of your heart in that is to put your heart in the wrong place. There is a greater healing, a greater healing from the inside out, because when you experience the inner healing, there is the promise of bodily resurrection, which is true and full and complete healing. And that's the correct way to read verse 15. Physical healing, perhaps, if the sovereign Holy Spirit desires to do it, you should ask. But spiritual healing, absolutely, guaranteed. We go back to him over and over with faith and confession of sin and that forgiveness and that promise of resurrection is for you and for me. So who among you is sick? Isn't it true that we're all sick? Is there anyone here who doesn't have sickness residing within, in them in some way or another? Who needs to confess sins to, to another person? 
I know I need to confess sins. In fact, as I was walking over here this morning, I realized I don't have the joy of the Lord. Not enough. Oh, Lord, forgive me. That's my confession to you, and I ask you to pray. Pray for me, that the Lord would fill me with his joy. There's no reason why there's anything in this life that should get me down, because I'm saved. I have the Holy Spirit. I should be full of joy. That's my confession. Do you have a confession that you need to make to others? Do you desire the messianic blessing of the anointing oil of his health? I can't imagine why you wouldn't desire it. Can you really believe that healing is guaranteed? Yes, you can believe it. You should believe it. If you're sick, initiate, earnestly pray. Allow others to earnestly pray for you. Put your faith in Christ. And then we're called to submit to the holy and perfect will of the Holy Spirit who will provide his healing in the exact measure that you need and he knows better what you need than you know. Tracy had such certainty that God intended to heal her patient Mary. The promise on that bracelet was God is within her. She will not fail. Was Tracy just believing empty promises and offering vain prayers? Mary went with home on hospice for six weeks, and Tracy didn't know what happened to her, wasn't sure what was going on. She continued to pray every day for Mary, that Mary would be healed. And she wasn't sure exactly where Mary's faith was either. But she continued to pray. And then some six weeks into hospice, Tracy had this intense sense that she had to pray that evening for Mary. And she prayed. She prayed. She almost called Mary and her husband, but then she decided it wouldn't be right. And so she just prayed. That night, she went to bed. And early the next morning, sometime in the night, Tracy had a dream about Mary, a dream that and she had never dreamed about Mary before. In the dream, she was on the 16th floor of the Brigham, going back to the very place where she had last saw Mary and her husband. And as she was about to go into the patient's room, Mary was there and burst out the door. Except in this dream, Mary wasn't sick. She was healed. She was completely healthy. In fact, in the dream, she was more healthy than any of you or me. In the dream, she was dressed almost like in royalty, with clothes so imaginative and creative that words can't quite describe. And she had this peace and this confidence within her. And Tracy knew that Mary was healed. And then Tracy woke. It was early in the morning. And her very first thought was that Mary had died. She didn't know what to do. That afternoon, having not heard from the family in six weeks, she received a message from Mary's husband that Mary had died that morning. And Tracy knew that God had fulfilled his promise. That bracelet that Mary wore until her death and then given back to Tracy at the funeral, this very story that Tracy was able to share with the entire family at the funeral, and which gave them great comfort to know that the Holy Spirit did not abandon her, that all the prayers and all the promises they were powerful and effective. God is within her. She will not fall. The very next phrase, that, that verse, God will help her when morning dawns. And that's what God did. Praise be to the Lord. But that's not just for Mary. The healing power of the resurrection of the Lord is for you and it's for me. It's for all of us to enter into this anointing. He offers it to you in faith, the prayer of faith. 
will save the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up. O oh Lord. O oh Lord. Holy Spirit, sovereign God, move in our midst. Do what only you can do. Help us to have faith. Fill in the doubt. Reveal your love and your power. Bring the fresh winds of the Spirit upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. Having heard the word of God read to us and preached to us, we now as a people respond back to God with a word of faith, of our confession of faith. This is a confession that's been said on the lips of men and women who love God and have walked with Jesus for thousands of years, for 17, 1800 years. And men and women have died for this confession, um, for what we believe. So Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to kneel or be seated as we pray and bring our burdens before the Lord. Almighty God, we come before you humbly, needy, broken, unwell, and we bring before you our own needs, our, our world as well, which is broken and needy. Lord, we don't know how to pray. We pray that you would teach us and speak through us by your spirit as we bring these burdens to you. Lord, we pray for our world, your world, which is broken and needy. We pray that you would minister your, your healing power and grace in the places of this world that are so dark and hopeless. We think of the violence going on in Ukraine and we pray that you would bring it to an end, Lord. Be merciful. God, we pray for those around the world in such destitute poverty that you would be present and ministering to their need. And we pray that you would empower your church to be an agent of your love and care across the globe. We do pray, Lord, for your church this body that you love under one head who is Jesus. We know there is only one true church. And we thank you that you love it and care for it, wash it and cleanse it, that you renew it. We pray that you would protect it, protect it from division. God, we pray that you bring healing to the divisions of the church around the globe. And we pray that you would bring strength and empowerment to the church, that we might take up our cross deny ourselves and follow you, Lord Jesus. We pray for those in authority and we, we pray that you would give them the fear of you, that they would govern. We pray for our President Joe, our Governor Charlie, our Mayor Michelle, that they would govern, Lord, with a, a longing for justice, with a hunger and a thirst for righteousness, that they would reject lies and self-seeking and use the authority that you have entrusted to them for good, and especially for the voiceless. We pray that we could live lives in peace. Bless our leaders, Lord. Father, we pray for our missionaries and for those who proclaim Christ here in Boston and around the globe. We pray that you would be their strength, their support, their encouragement. Lord, we pray that their hearts would be renewed by faith, that they would be deeply planted in the word and that you would speak, Lord, words of encouragement to them day by day. Lord, we pray for the Afghan families that you've called us to serve and blessed us with the opportunity to care for. We pray that you would draw near to them, that you would meet them in their very practical needs. And we pray for those in our community who are on the front line of this work and ministry, that you would be their support and strength, that you would give them wisdom, that you would be their empowerment, Lord, for love and care, even as the days grow long and as the challenges continue to mount, we pray for encouragement and patience and endurance as a body as we seek to love them well. God, we thank you for the students among us, and we are grateful for those who reach the end of their program and are graduating this May or June. We pray that you would guide them and direct them in the next steps of their lives, that they would use all that they have learned, not for their own ends or sake or for glory for themselves, but for you, that they would be agents of your, your kingdom in the vocations to which you have called them. God, we pray for our teenagers, and we thank you so much for the citywide gathering that was here on Friday night for many different youth from many different churches being encouraged and ministered to through your word and music and song. And we thank you, Lord, for this, this ministry that is growing, and we pray for our teenagers, that you would draw near to them and that they would come to know you deeply and personally. And we just cry out to you, Lord, in the midst of the world that has so much that it offers, so many lies, so many dead ends, so many heartaches. We pray that you would intervene by your mercy and grace in every family in this community that has teenagers at home or, or away, that you would intervene, Lord, and do a good work of calling our children to you. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we pray for this body as well. We pray that you would bring health to this church in deeper ways. We pray for the 
different committees and governing bodies for the Board of Elders, for our deacons, for the Missions Committee, for the Personnel Committee, for the f &A Committee. We pray for the ministers and the staff. Lord, we pray that you would bring about a deep purity of heart among your people and that those that you've called to serve in roles of leadership in this community would do so in the fear of you and for your glory and your glory alone. God, we love you. I pray that you would pour out your love into our hearts through your Holy Spirit, that every man, woman, and child in this room, in this community, would be deeply rooted and grounded in your love. How good you are to love us, God. How good you are to invite us to bring our burdens before you in prayer. We love you, and we pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. I invite you now to just remain seated or to kneel as we confess our sins before God. God has called us to live a life of love, to love him with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love our neighbors as ourselves, and there's not one of us here that lives up to that. We all fall short, and so this is a time where we can come before him and confess our sins against him and against our neighbor. And we'll do this first in silence and then aloud together. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. God has promised to all those who come to him with hearty repentance and true faith that he will forgive us of our sins. So may you know and be encouraged and grounded in the reality of his grace and forgiveness over you this morning. Also, hear these comforting words of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ out of Romans chapter 5. For God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. So let's take up an offering now, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name, bring an offering and come into his courts.
Almighty Father, we thank you for what you've given to us, and we offer this small token of yours back to you, and pray that you would use these gifts, Lord, to advance the work of your kingdom, to lift up the name of Jesus above everything else in this world and in this city, and we pray that you would use these gifts as well to meet and care for the needs of the poor. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We now have this great privilege of partaking together in this meal that Jesus began the night before, instituted the night before he was crucified and three days before he rose from the dead. And this is a meal for those of you who are baptized and walking with Jesus in repentance and faith. And if you're here today and that doesn't describe you, we're really glad that you're here. You're welcome during the time that we take this meal together to either just come forward and cross your arms and one of us will pray for you or you can also remain in your seats during this time as well. This is a meal that depicts for us the, the very life of Jesus that we run on, that, that is our fuel. And, uh, and so we come to him with thankful and grateful hearts for what he's done for us as we remember his death and resurrection and partake in this meal together. So let's come to him and worship with joyful hearts. Let's pray. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise you. You are worthy of all glory and honor and power. In your infinite love, you made us for yourself, Lord. And we did not give thanks to you or honor you as God, but falling into sin, we became subject to evil and death. We turned away from you. And yet you, in your tender mercy, as a great and loving Father, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself there in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world, once and for all. He died in our place, and you accepted his offering by raising him from death and granting him right, great honor, Lord, at your right hand on high. We thank you for this beautiful and great redemption that is ours in Christ. Hear us, merciful Father, we pray, and by your Holy Spirit, grant that we who partake in this meal together, who eat this bread and drink from this cup, that we might partake of Jesus and feed upon him spiritually by faith and with great thanksgiving. Lord, we celebrate this new covenant with joy, and we await the glorious appearing of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who will unite all things in heaven and on earth, raising us from death and making all things new. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. Amen. You can be seated. Just a few instructions. You'll be dismissed by row to come forward to receive the meal, and we'll begin with the balcony. Uh, when you do come forward, you're welcome to just receive the bread and then partake of it and then take the cup, and you'll set the cup when you finish on the table nearby and then you can return to your seats. So let's worship the Lord. There are gluten-free wafers as well.
Let's stand together and give thanks for this meal that we've received from our Lord, and then we will sing our closing hymn together. Almighty Father, we thank you for the reminder at this meal that we are a part of your body, the body of your Son, and part of the blessed company of all faithful people, that we are heirs together with all who have come before us of your eternal kingdom. We pray that you would send us out into the world in the power of your Holy Spirit, that we might do those good works that you've prepared beforehand for us to walk in, that we might walk as the healed people of you, our God, giving glory and praise and honor to you. We thank you for your love, grace, and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Christ is risen, which means that we do know there is full and certain healing for all those who come to him by faith. And that is the source of our joy. I do pray that you'll go forth from this place in the fullness of resurrection joy as the people of God. If you would like to receive prayer, 
prayer for healing, prayer for anything else, feel free to come to the front right of the sanctuary after the service to receive prayer. There are refreshments in the Welcome Center downstairs. We'd love to get to know you and have you get to know one another as well. Now receive the benediction. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that by the power of the Holy Spirit you might abound in hope and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you now and remain with you always. Amen.